Joanna Cassidy, ladies and gentlemen. Please help us welcome Joanna Cassidy. Zora. Next we have William Sanderson, ladies and gentlemen. A Mr. J.F. Sebastian. Next we have Sean Young. We have Rachel here, folks. Rachel's here today with us. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, Rutger Hauer. Folks, Roy Batty is here today. Thank you all for being here. I very much appreciate it. Now, I promised my wife that uh, I wouldn't geek out too much and monopolize the conversation. So uh, I'm going to try to get through this as quick as possible. Plus, we only have 50 minutes, so trying to fit. 35 years or more into 50 minutes is going to be tough. We're going to make this happen. Um, she was very specific that the panel's uh, audience and the audience can get a chance to speak. So I'll say uh, I'll get some. I'll get some. Do some prepared questions. Um, I don't have my VoIP contest. They wouldn't let me bring it in through the security. So I'm going to do my best to question them and just power through this. We also have a few questions selected from various online fan groups, uh, and I'd also like to field some questions from the audience. I'm sure I have questions now. A couple people. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I appreciate the time you've all taken out of your busy schedule to be here with us today. Making this such a momentous occasion, it's been a special year indeed for the Blade Runner franchise, as we've been given a sequel, finally. And although I do very much appreciate 2049, and we do have a few questions in the regard, we're mostly going to try and focus on the original. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, I have a question, and if I can ask you all to answer this one at a time, that'd be fantastic. On the set, did you feel the strains and stresses of the film going over budget? How did it affect you as actors? No, I really didn't feel that stress. I wasn't on as long as everybody else was. Uh, there was some... Uh, if you read about the, all these stresses later on, I didn't realize it was just a, uh, another movie going on at the time. I just remember the stress of the smoke. There's <laughs> a lot of smoke in that. Um, I felt the stress. I came on last... In the movie, you know, they had to get everything done in the short time. I had to do it, and at the end, when Zora dies, and I had one shot of doing it. And <laughs> Rutger had a scene after me, and they were they were closing the shop down. And uh, at the end, I pressed the squib when I was dying, and the blood came out. I had to press it exactly on my mark. There was not going to be a retake, and the sun was coming up, and it was really frightening. I had one shot at it. And we never got to shoot the snake dance, but I did do it years later. Look for it. It's called What Might Have Been, folks. It's a fantastic homage to the Zora character. And if you get a chance, it's, it's really a delight for all the fans. Please. I, I didn't feel stress of getting behind the narcissist who only thinks of himself. And so I didn't pay much attention, but uh, I uh, had to wear two hours of makeup, and as it got harder for the summer, that was a problem, but I was just happy to be there. Hello? All the time, I knew it was 45 million dollars, and I knew Michael Dela was really afraid that we were going over budget. I used to ask him all kinds of questions all the time, and then I even talked to him after the movie came out. I said, "So how did it do?" And he was really disappointed that it didn't make a gazillion million dollars the first weekend, but he got over it after about 10 minutes. Yeah, sometimes it's, it's what it takes. You know? 
pressure. And uh, I peed my panties, but that, that was all. Percy, I love the guy because I started as a sweet extra. He wrote that whole thing offhand. That was my very, very first line ever in uh, movies. Home again, home again, Jake and Jake. I'm very lucky because I can say that to a director at an audition, and the guy's eyes go wide and go, "Oh my God!" And there, and many times that's a that's a cue to actually I got I get the job because. I've worked on Blade Runner and Ridley, with Ridley Scott, so with me, we had a great time sharing the scotch in the rain many times. I had a great time. Um, Ridley took good care of me. I felt like he, he was very into all the women who we looked um, and uh, went to great lengths to make them all over, even the extras. The end result is I, I was really very pleased. I thought that Zora became something that was never on the page. And, and that Rachel and Chris Zora really, really worked. That's okay. Great start. Uh, especially when the Give me some fun direction. Whisper in my ear. You might say this is a total of the NSME. That, that's liberating. Whether it's a lie or not. That he's a saint. He's a manipulative cocksucker. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Ridley. Isolated me. I thought it was kind of difficult. He, he, he kept me in my little trailer, in my little wooden box all the time and wouldn't let me come out. So I eventually had to grab the second assistant's radio so I would know when they wanted me so I could rush back to my little box and pretend I'd been in there for the last two hours. So, yeah, no, he's a great guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um. Uh, this, this film means the world to me, and I'm sure you understand why, but there are more reasons. But I, I could make a documentary about that, really. Um, he made me dance, and I think I made him dance too when we shot the movie. And we we were about, you know, the only two who had a less of a bad time. I didn't have a bad time in that movie at all. Of course I feel the stress, but that's, you need that somehow. You know? It needs. You know, if it wasn't for Ridley's stubborn, whatever, you know, vision, this movie wouldn't be here. And I think it's great that he's still there in 40 years or something. So, he's a, he's a rock, what can I say? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need some questions from the audience if we have a microphone, too. Promise them we get some. Absolutely. Um, I'll go out there. I have one question while I'm making my way into the audience, if that's okay. Uh, what was the single most inspiring lesson you all learned while working on Blade Runner, either as an actor or something more visceral? What did you take with you? Don't fucking give up. <laughs> I'm gonna go out to the audience because I see that look and I know what that look means. I'm going out there now. If anybody has a question, could you please put your hand up now? Okay, hold on one second. So, with the hat, introduce yourself and then state your question. Hi, my name is Tim from Boston. Welcome to Winnicon. Uh, my question, I guess, is for Joanna and Rucker, excuse me, specifically. Um, back in 82, tattoos weren't really regarded as they are today. They were a little kind of sorted, you saw some of the tattoos, you might cross the streets, get away from them. Uh, 
Rivera, you had a tattoo on your neck back then. No woman was supporting a tattoo on her neck. And Franca also had some tattoos. What were they? The tattoos were, the idea of the tattoos were that they were like plug-in points for all kinds of shit. You know, high tech shit, whatever. But because the tattoos in the rain, uh, the lighting washed out the tattoos, so you never really got to see them other than in pictures. But it was like plugins, you know, shit here, you know, that sort of stuff. Okay, we have another question in the audience. Um, uh, let me answer your question. Uh, the tattoo, yeah, it was very new at the time. The tats are quite normal now. And, um, uh, we, uh, Westmore was a big thing at the time. Um, we played with that tattoo to make sure that the snake was, was flattering, you know, it didn't came around the chin and didn't look bad, didn't look weird, but it was really a, a piece that I, I was it was your snake, right? It was her snake. The real one. Can I say your name? Next time, question. 